Oh, seems to be working now. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that slight technical difficulty. Uh, welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series. I'm Stacy McKenna, and I will be moderating this discussion. Today, we have our Islamist Watch Director, Mr. Sam Westrop, here to speak on where Europe went wrong in its attempt to fight the radicalization of its immigrant Muslim populations. Mr. Westrop will speak, speak for roughly five to 10 minutes on the topic and then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to submit a question at any time. We have many participants on this webinar, so I apologize in advance if we do not get to yours today. And now I'll turn it over to Mr. Sam Westrop. Hello, thank you. Um, in about 2014, uh, Abdul Wahid Majid uh, got into a truck um, and drove into a Syrian prison, exploding the truck and himself and the perimeter of the prison. Uh, he was one of many British Islamist suicide bombers of the time. And just before he got into the truck, he was filmed by his ISIS compatriots. And they said uh, in Arabic, they said, brother, Achi, uh, say a few words, say a few words in Arabic for the camera. And he turned to the camera and said, I'm, I'm sorry, in English, and said, I'm sorry, I, I didn't speak Arabic. I don't know any. Um, Majid, like about 70, 80% of, of British Muslims was Pakistani and didn't speak Arabic. Most British Muslims do not speak Arabic. Most European Muslims do not speak Arabic. And that is because Islam in Europe uh, comes from a, all across the world. There's a huge South Asian contingent in Britain. Germany has a very large Turkish population. Uh, France has a very large North African uh, population. And so it's a very diverse uh, uh, mix of groups of which Arab Islam is not the primary demographic. And yet from about 2012, 2018, 19, thousands of Europeans went to Syria to fight for the Islamic State. They went to fight for an Arab Islamist cause despite many of them not being Arab themselves. Why is this? Why is it that a generation of European Muslims felt radicalized enough to fight an Arab Islamist cause, even though they came from Muslim communities all over the world that traditionally had very little to do with Arab Islamism? And compare that to the US. Um, Britain has about uh, uh, three million Muslims. Uh, the US has in between maybe three and four. Almost a thousand British Muslims went to fight for the Islamic State maybe just 100, a few 150 American Muslims went to fight for the Islamic State. So why that discrepancy? Why did radicalization set in in Europe uh, in a way that it hasn't done in the US, at least not to the same extent? Now, one of my theories about this and something that I think has a growing number of academics and, and counter extremist researchers are beginning to look at as well, is that Europe radicalize its own Muslim populations by homogenizing them, by giving Islamists power uh, and sidelining moderate Muslims. And they did this in a, a number of ways. I think the most stunning example of this is the Salman Rushdie affair. Um, you may remember uh, Salman Rushdie wrote a book, The Satanic Verses. Uh, it was uh, attacked, denounced by Islamist groups all around the world. Iran put out a fatwa on the author, Salman Rushdie's head. Saudi Arabia campaigned for it to be banned. And Islamists in the West, uh, uh, also uh, acted very hard to suppress the book, to uh, attack its author, uh, and uh, most famously, they burnt the book in a, in a small town in Northern England. And this affair, I think, sums up the problem of, of, of radicalization and the British government's response to its Muslim communities in Europe. So let me give you this as a quick example. In about uh, in 1989, um, Muslims were competing, Islamists were competing to be the most outraged over the question of the Salman Rushdie uh, affair. Uh, the Salafis, um, tied closely to Saudi Arabia, were lobbying Muslim governments around the world to ban it. Uh, South Asian Islamists like Jamaat Islami, very prominent force in the UK, was encouraging the British government to ban it. And then another group called the Deobandis. Uh, were actively holding protests, including that very famous scene where they burnt this book in front of the world's TV cameras. Now, they were able to uh, do this, uh, and with no less the support of local government councillors who were there at this book burning, because the Dea Bandis had set up an organisation that had applied for government funding. And under the British cult, uh, uh, model of multiculturalism, in which the government deputise 
certain Muslim organizations to provide social services, uh, from healthcare to education. The Stay Abandi group behind this book burning was already tied into the local government. It was already receiving government funds and it was already working with local government councillors. And so they held this, this rally and the government did not object and as mentioned, local councillors attended. Um, Islamists were competing with each other at the time to be the most outraged over the Sun Rushdie affair because they knew whoever emerged from this would help lead British Islam, European Islam, Western Islam. Uh, and in the wake of the Sun Rushdie affair, the government made this worse. It increased these multiculturalist policies. It increased this idea. It, it lent more heavily on this idea that it could rely on intermediaries uh, within the Muslim community to run the Muslim community and to provide certain social services. This is what multiculturalist policy in Europe is. It's about dividing people into communities rather than regarding them as individuals. So in the wake of Salman Rushdie, uh, groups like the Muslim Council of Britain, uh, which was set up by uh, some extremely unpleasant Islamists with ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, to the Day of Bandis, whom I just mentioned, uh, came to be seen by government as the key voice of British Muslims and treated as such. And over the next few decades, government turned to Islamists to speak to the Muslim community. And no wonder Islamists rose to the fore to represent British Muslims as political uh, uh, movements. They were inherently, uh, they were innately best prepared to assume political roles in the representation of, of British Muslims. And the same is true all across Europe. Um, as governments enacted these multiculturalist policies, Islamists stepped forward and they came to run uh, European Islam. Uh, and at some point, the, 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 the ties between government and Islamist leadership of Western Muslims was so entwined that at one point, Jack Straw, under the Tony Blair government in the, in the early 2000s, Jack Straw, the foreign secretary, so, uh, had the same speechwriter as the head of the Muslim Council of Britain. And by the way, the head of the Muslim Council of Britain at the time, Iqbal, uh, Iqbal Sukrani, was one of the key voices in the Salman Rushdie affair who would called for his, 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 his killing and endorsed the fatwa. Uh, so, so multiculturalism brought government and Islamists arm in arm. Um, and it took two decades for the British government to realize this might have been a mistake. It, it manifested in other ways too. There were in uh, 2016, 15, 16, there was something called the Trojan Horse Affair, which was the sudden realization by government that Islamists had taken over taxpayer funded schools and were using it to advance an extremely sinister and dangerous agenda. Uh, at one school in Luton called the Olive Tree Primary School, children are taught that uh, uh, the, the, pun the, the Sharia punishments for adultery, for homosexuality, for all manner of things. And this is subsidized by the taxpayer. Um, uh, amazingly, the people who wrote the documents uh, that came to advise government on how to run Muslim schools through the multiculturalist model, the man who wrote this document, a man called Tahir Alam, was later identified as a key person behind a plot to take over these uh, uh, taxpayer funded faith schools and advance an Islamist agenda. So this is, uh, there's this extraordinary intertwining of Islamists with access to government uh, and Islamists who are prepared to do really quite underhand things to advance their agenda, to push an extremist message. Um, uh, the government, as I mentioned, eventually starts to realize this. And in uh, 2008, um, the British Home Secretary at the time suddenly realized that one of the Muslim Council of Britain's uh, uh, chief officials had signed a, a document in Istanbul that called for attacks on British troops and Jewish communities. And she was shocked, shocked to find this out. Um, uh, and they did the right thing. They cut off the Muslim Council of Britain. Uh, that continued under the, 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 in 2010 with a, a new conservative government. Uh, David Cameron, the then prime minister said, for years, we have been funding Islamist groups to fight Islamism. We've been funding extremists to fight terrorism. This is madness. And he said, this is like turning to a fascist group to help fight a violent neo-Nazi movement. Uh, similar rhetoric was started to be echoed across Europe. Uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel has said uh, some very critical things about multiculturalist policy and the effects on radicalization. Sarkozy in France uh, said much the same. Um, Europe is beginning to realize that decades, decades of treating Muslims as a homogenous block and accepting that Islamist groups uh, who claim to represent all Muslims, accepting that at face value without questioning it, they're starting to understand in Europe that this was a bad idea. 
they're starting to understand it's a little too late. Uh, and with tens of thousands of European Muslims having got, sorry, thousands and thousands, sorry, of European Muslims having gone off to join ISIS, it certainly is too late for some. I'll give one last very quick example. Imagine you're a Muslim in East London. Um, you grow up uh, in a place called Tower Hamlets. You go to a, a taxpayer funded faith school where you're taught Islamist messaging. Uh, you might go to the local mosque, which is, uh, may receive taxpayer funds for counter extremism work, for interfaith work, where you hear Islamist uh, ideas in the after school study clubs. You maybe go to university, taxpayer funded university, uh, where you join a Muslim student society, all of which are under uh, Islamist control, under a group called FOSIS. Uh, you may leave university and go work for an Islamist charity that also receives government funds, or maybe an Islamist think tank that also receives government funds, or maybe an Islamist counter extremism group that also receives government funds. It's possible to grow up uh, as an Islamist recruit in Britain and be entirely the beneficiary of, of the taxpayers' largesse. And no wonder that places like East London, where this happens, send a lot of kids off as young as 15 to, to fight and die for the Islamic State. Uh, this is an enormous problem uh, across Europe. As I say, they've realized it too late. America has a lot more time. The radicalization here is much less. The Muslim community is much more diverse, less chance of homogenizing it under Islamist leadership. Although that is happening because of a failure by American media, American government, American conservatism as well, to understand the threat of Islamism and to deal with it accordingly. And to not, and, they, and America must learn from Europe's mistakes and not treat Islamists as representatives as Muslims, not homogenize American Islam, and not empower Islamists politically, financially, through the media and academia. Uh, I'll stop there, because there's a lot more I can talk about this subject, and I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, I guess the question that I've received before we even got started on this was, um, how does one different, differentiate a moderate Muslim versus an extremist? Are there any outward distinctions, say like the outward appearances of a US church often shows which denomination it is? So I think one of the most important things that, uh, that if you could take one thing away from this call today uh, would be this point that uh, do not see Islam in the West, in, in the East, everywhere, do not see it uh, as a homogenous block, as I mentioned, do not even see it as moderate and extreme. Uh, Islam is a you know, 1400 year old religion that encompasses a, a wide gamut of ideas. There are hundreds, thousands of different sects. There are Muslims delineated by, by ethnicity, by jurisprudence, uh, by, um, uh, 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 you know, by Shia and Sunni, by uh, certain sects within those, by uh, spiritual orders such as Sufis. Um, even within the Islamist world, there are hundreds of Islamist movements that sometimes spend more time fighting each other than, than fighting non-Muslims or, or moderate Muslims. So within that, within that uh, very uh, diverse array of, of Western Islam, uh, there are, of course, moderate groups on one side. There are also very extreme groups on the other. But then there are a lot of people right in the middle who may fall either side. Um, we regard, at Islamist Watch, the Middle East Forum, we regard moderate Muslims by a pretty simple standard. If you do not support, if you, if you oppose theocracy and merely support Islam as the private practicing of faith and a free society, then we count you as a moderate. And there are a lot of those around. As I say, they lack a voice because for decades, politicians, journalists, media, priests, academics have, have empowered Islamists to speak on their behalf. Thank you. Uh, what specific steps should be taken in the U.S. to stop what's happened in Europe? Well, for a start, let's make sure we're not practicing the same multiculturalist policies that empower Islamists. Now, although America doesn't have a federal multiculturalist I I idea for the most part, locally, this does happen. You do see, I I'm speaking to you from Boston today. The, the mayor's office here in Boston has long worked with the Islamic Society of Boston, a very dangerous mosque. Uh, the, whose founding trustees included Yusuf al Karadawi, the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. The mayor's office has long worked with the mosque, subsidized uh, it through sort of cheap land deals and other uh, very dodgy goings ons. Um, uh, so the same sort of corrupt attitude towards religious communities does take place in the US. And the most important thing America can do is make sure that doesn't happen, is to enforce the separation of church and state for a start. Uh, Islamist Watch has uncovered. 
uh, over $60 million worth of federal money that has worked its way into the hands of Islamist groups uh, over the last five, six years. Um, the, even under the Trump administration, in fact, that figure has grown. Let me repeat that, by the way. Um, Islamists are getting more money under the Trump administration from the federal government than they were under the Obama administration. So America needs to stop this immediately. Every, every cent that goes out gives Islamists power. It sidelines moderate Muslims. And by the way, one of the, the chief, when I, when, I, when I write to someone, or I speak to someone and say, hey, you're about to do an event, you're about to work with some, this, this, this Muslim organization, it's not Muslim, it's Islamist. One of the most frequent responses I'll get if they want to go ahead anyway is, well, I see they've worked with local government or they've received government funds. How bad can they be? Uh, this happened just a few days ago. The, the most dangerous thing government can do is fund the very extremists that seek to destroy their society. That seems like an obvious point, but America, American officials, especially in the federal government, don't seem to have realized that yet. Thank you. Along those lines, do you consider Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar leaning more on the extremist side? Oh, I think they're extreme. I don't think they're Islamist. Uh, and let me, <laughs> let me explain why. Rashida Tlaib, um, uh, I think she, at one point she said, my God is a she. You can imagine how, how furious uh, so many Islamists were when uh, their so-called Muslim Congresswoman refers to God as female. Um, Ilan Omar, uh, according to some, uh, you know, has affairs, um, dances at gay rights parades. If you look at, especially Salafi uh, clerics in the US, they regard Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib as deviants, as apostates. Some have even declared takfir, which means uh, excommunication. They've essentially denounced them as non-Muslims. So that they're, they're extreme politically, certainly. I don't regard them as Islamists because I haven't really come across a clear example of either advocating an Islamist idea. What they do say, they do, they do uh, express far left ideas that enable Islamism, that, are, that are facilitate Islamism. But yeah, I, I regard them as far left fellow travelers who happen to identify as Muslim rather than Islamists. That was a great answer. Uh, we are unfortunately running out of time, but I suppose this can be the last one. How is it possible to get American media to pay more attention to the real story without being labeled as Islamophobic? Well, I, I wish there was a, I had a good answer to that one, then it's a problem we encounter constantly. As I'm, perhaps as the question is aware, Islamophobia has been used uh, very keenly by Islamist organizations to suppress their critics. And they have been incredibly successful. Uh, in this regard. Um, the most important thing we can do is firstly present cool hard facts, uh, especially about Islamist uh, activity. Uh, uh, I find it problematic to go to a journalist and say, you know, have you seen this passage in the Quran? They don't want to talk about that. They're not interested in the theology. And to be honest, neither are we. Uh, however, if you go to them and say, look, this local cleric whom your paper has previously profiled or praised has said this about the Jews, this about homosexuals, if you present them with the clear evidence, uh, then sometimes we see some success. The other very important thing you can do is find moderate Muslims in your area to, to work with and to help get them to, to help you present this information to local journalists. There are, I very much recommend reaching out to the Muslim reform movement, um, uh, which is, is working with Muslims all across the US who are moderate, who are reformist, and who are dedicated to fighting Islamism uh, across the US. Uh, it's, the media is the huge challenge uh, of, of our age. Uh, it's particularly bad in the US compared to Europe, by the way. And I, would, I know I'm running over time very quickly. It's fascinating to me that one of the reasons that the government in, in Europe changed its mind and changed its understanding about Islamism was because the left wing media actually started asking questions. In 2005, a journalist called Martin Bright said, hang on a second, we've been pouring tens of millions of pounds of dollars into Islamist groups. Has anyone ever said, who are these people claiming to represent the Muslim community and what do they believe? No one had ever asked that question before. And it took a left wing journalist to ask it. We need that to happen in the US. And with the current state of the US media, I fear it's not gonna happen anytime soon. But the more you, uh, in your local communities can speak to your local newspapers, your local TV, and talk to them about the facts that Islamist Watch gathers and any facts anyone else gathers, uh, the better chance we have of, of, of changing the narrative in this country, and that's vital. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to enlighten us all. 
We have come to the close of our webinar. There will be a short survey to fill out. And um, we'll be sending out an invitation on our upcoming weekly Israel Insider webinar series with Ashley Perry and a webinar on Friday, again with Mr. Westrop and Mr. Cliff Smith of the Washington Project on uncovering terror funding and foreign aid, the Islam Islamic Relief Agency scandal. Thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful day.